today, people are just awakening from this awful delusion that somehow government doesn't owe people anything. And we become a government of the corporations, by the corporations, and for the corporations. Everything we've been talking about is an example of that. Uh, we have not been the gold standard for democracy for a long time. And I think that Americans are some of the last people in the world to wake up and see that. The one common denominator in all of this is poverty. I think it's fair to say that the Republicans started it, but no Democrat has stopped it in terms of presidents. And we need a president now who will just come in and cut the cord and say, this has got to stop. We need a president who says, within 10 years, every public school in America is going to be a palace of, of culture and learning and the arts. As long as you've got 80% of the American people who on some level are struggling to survive, you're not gonna have thriving communities everywhere. You have one third of Americans who live on less than $15 an hour. Half of them can't find a place to live. You tell me how much bandwidth that person has to be a good father, mother, lover, friend, husband, wife, citizen. And I believe that the United States needs to be, to see our highest ally as humanity itself. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Over the last year, 86.6% of our regular viewers have not yet hit the subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It's a small gesture on your end and a huge leap forward for our channel. If you wouldn't mind, we would love to ask you if you found our channel informative and engaging, if you can please hit that subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It allows us to go ahead and continue to put out great content, better guests, and as always, we will always put out two episodes per week. Thank you so much. How do you respond to critics who suggest that U.S. is no longer the gold standard for democratic governments? And what both transformative <laughs> actions would you champion to restore faith in our system? My response is, duh. Uh, we have not been the gold standard for democracy for a long time, I'm afraid. And I think that Americans are some of the last people in the world to wake up and see that. Now, my frustration as a candidate is that I do believe we have a critical mass of Americans who do see it and would like to take a different direction, who recognize the, the course correction that's necessary. Uh, you can either have corporate power as your governing principle and short-term profits for short profit maximization for huge corporate entities, your bottom line, or you can have democratic values and democracy and humanitarian uh, values your bottom line. And we have shifted from a government of the people, by the people, for the people, which is what the essence of a democratic society would be. And we become a government of the corporations, by the corporations, and for the corporations. Everything we've been talking about is an example of that. Because these huge media empires are corporations. What does it, what will yeah. it take to fix this? Well, one thing it will take is exactly what we're talking about here, a president who's willing to name that more and more people elected who are willing to name it, people who are willing to, um, to recognize in, you know, we have public policy after public policy made by legislators who do more to serve the goals, the profit-making goals of their donors than to serve the goal of safety, health, and well-being of their own constituents, even when the constituents have expressed what their will is. And of course, that's, that's the death of democracy right there. But that's how much influence corporate money has on Washington. And the suppression of my political campaign is a perfect example. It's just a microcosm of that. It's no different. It's whether it's suppressing uh, progressive candidates, whether it's carcinogens in our food, whether it's toxins in our air, whether it's PFAS in our water, whether it's ramping up fossil fuel extraction when we should be ramping it down, whether it's chemicals in our pesticides, whether it's wars that should never have been fought, um, it, 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 
I don't believe the problem is that Americans don't see it. I think on both the left and the right, uh, a lot of people see it. That's not, in my experience, the problem. The problem is this chlorotic political system that sits on the will of the people in just the ways we've been talking about here today. And when do you think we stopped as Americans seeing uh, American democracy as a gold standard? Because it wasn't always like that. Well, I think it, those were very pivotal years right after World War II. And um, once Ronald Reagan, you know, we could talk about what year did, you know, it was sort of a gradual process. But with Ronald Reagan and trickle-down economics and the Koch brothers' agenda and the complete glorification of this idea that, you know, if you just give more money to the stockholders, that all that money will trickle down and lift all boats, the biggest lie the biggest con ever played on the American people, it was in full bore. So in that sense, even if you say it started with Reagan, I think it's fair to say that the Republicans started it, but no Democrat has stopped it in terms of presidents. And we need a president now who will just come in and cut the cord and say, this has got to stop. It's been an aberrational chapter of American history. Uh, it has hollowed out our middle class. It has decimated this country and our democracy and it's also led to the deaths of probably millions of people around the world hmm. at least indirectly a lot of times you've criticized the u.s for being the only country that funds public education through property taxes so my question is what alternative funding models do you propose to ensure equitable education for all you simply make that your goal, that the federal government compensates in any place where it needs to, and which happens to some extent. But right now, uh, we need a president who says, within 10 years, every public school in America is going to be a palace of, of culture and learning and the arts. But on the other hand, or at the same time, it's not a but, it's an and, in ways that we were talking about earlier, some of these children are traumatized by the, t by the time they come to that school. I mean, the breakdown is so multidimensional at this point. We need a season of repair in this country. You know, when Roosevelt said, it has become fairly clear to me we're going to have to become radical, fairly radical for a generation. I think that in order to truly repair, to truly get this country back on the rails, it's going to be a generational challenge. I don't claim that in my four years in the White House, I could turn the ship around entirely. I think I could get it around the bend, though. I could get it around the curve. Mm. And, that, and that would help with such things as a Department of Children and Youth. But I'll tell you something. The one common denominator in all of this is poverty. The one common denominator in pretty much every situation that we could describe as problematical is a rigged economic system. Um, Louis Brandeis, late Supreme Court Justice, said you can have large amounts of money concentrated in the hands of a few or you can have democracy, you cannot have both. So as long as you've got 80% of the American people who on some level are struggling to survive, you're not gonna have thriving communities everywhere. And where you have, as 70% of the American people say, they live in constant economic stress, when you have stress, obviously the stress is trickle, does trickle down. The money doesn't trickle down in this country, but the stress trickles down. And it stresses, it, it trickles down to the least powerful person in the system. And that's the child. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. There are so many teachers that are saying this industry, this sector is highly insulting. It's disrespectful. I don't even receive enough pay to put food on my table or clothe my children. 
And it, it's, it's really unfortunate that in America, we face a big lack of respect in the profession. Forget about the money. Forget about the salary. Forget about we pay our teachers like nothing. Well, the two sort of go together because in a obsessively capitalistic society, money is what gets you mm. respect, <laughs> right? We're losing our teachers. We're just losing yep. them. And for the reason people are saying, this isn't what I signed up for. I didn't sign up for crowd control. I didn't sign up to have to deal with a child's behavioral issues, making it impossible for me to teach the rest of the class. I didn't sign up to be afraid of students. I didn't sign right. up to risk my life. W was it different 20 or 30 years ago? Absolutely. We, when, when I was growing up, of course, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, I was an adult, but when I was a kid, you just, I remember there was a horrible crime committed at an elementary school when I was a child, but it was so unheard of. I mean, it was like, you know, today it's like, wh where was the latest massacre this week? Right. Um, I mean, I don't want to whitewash or romanticize uh, American society when I was growing up, because I think that there were also neighborhoods that I wasn't living in where there was already a lot of mm -hmm. stress and strain, clearly. Um, so I'm, I'm not trying to romanticize the past in all layers, but there was the difference. It seemed to me, seems to me is that there was a, a time in my life where there was a general consensus that we were supposed to try to be good. We were supposed to try to treat people well. Government was supposed to try to make it easier to help people thrive. Today, people are just awakening from this awful delusion that somehow government doesn't owe people anything. That all government owes, basically, is to, to satisfy its donor class. Because its donor class claims to be the guardians, they have the right to be the guardians of the economy turning us into a right. country where instead of the economy serving people, people serve the economy. They wake up early in the morning, you have one third of Americans who live on less than $15 an hour. Half of them can't find a place to live. You tell me how much bandwidth that person has to be a good father, mother, lover, friend, husband, wife, citizen. How much time and bandwidth do they even have? And where is their stress and anxiety supposed to go? What do you think about hanging, giving the money to parents? And I see a lot of parents right now going to homeschool and we pulling out the money funds from the public sector and giving to the uh, households and they do homeschooling it's themselves. Complicated. It's a complicated topic. On one hand, as a parent, I can understand how in some situations a parent would say, I don't want my kid going to a school where they're going to be bullied in the hallway or blow jobs in the bathroom. I mean, I can understand mm -hmm. some parents going, no, no, I'm, I'm taking my kid. On the other hand, it has its own series of problems. You know, they used to call public schools common schools. This goes back to the issue I was talking about earlier about socialization. Um, and also, obviously, if you take money away from the public school system on a certain level, how is it going to get better? But I don't think we can blame parents uh, in many cases for not wanting their kids in certain schools. On the other hand, we're learning things about what's going on in some of these homeschool environments. We're learning about Christian nationalism, some far right indoctrination, you know. <laughs> there's no simple, there's no simple solution. No, Vlad. No simple <laughs> That's the reality. That is a sad reality. Where do you even start approaching all these problems? I mean, it's, it, it sounds like very difficult task. <laughs> Well, this is why you need as many people involved in the conversation and tackle these problems. The Western mind wants to know what to do. The American mind immediately goes into, just tell me what to do and we can do it. Because mm -hmm. we've never had a time in our history where that didn't work for us. We're go-getters, just tell us what to do, Mr. Roosevelt, and we can do it. This yeah. is more like a cancer that has metastasized. Invasive measures will only make things worse in certain cases. So the, this is a moment for doing exactly what we're doing here. 
let's really analyze, go deep. We have to become deeper thinkers. Now, the, the, the very Western mind says, no, we got to do something. The, the more Eastern orientation would say, no, we have to understand something first. We, it's okay that we're having these deeper conversations because we're going to have these things have to be dealt with on a holistic basis. We have to take an integrative approach. It's nutrition and economics and education and criminal justice. It's all of the above. And so when we have the larger conversation, we have to become more 21st century thinkers. But I think the leader to take us into this period of, of initiation to help initiate, uh, inaugurate it is someone who herself uh, or whomever recognizes the larger picture. Mm. We have so many brain cells, so many synapses that are not operative yet because they're still thinking along the old model. We have to talk about root cause solutions. If you go to my website, there's a whole section called root cause healing where we have to get at root causes and not just solutions. When you say, where do you start though? For me as a presidential candidate, you have to start with economic reform because at the bottom of so many of these situations is the fact that people are struggling to survive. And so they don't even have time. They don't even have bandwidth to be parents, to be, the people that we need to be to even begin to handle these things. If only 20% of your citizens have even the economic um, uh, ability, really, yeah. to sit and think and to be part of the solution, that's, uh, that's I can tell you right there, that's, that's certainly not point. an American, yeah. How exhausting is it uh, to, to try? I see you're traveling to so many places and coming. So I commend you on that. It's 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 really amazing. Uh, so how's that journey been? I know you've experienced it uh, before in 2020, but now uh, you, you know you're back on the road and and, and so many uh, media events and traveling and speaking. How's that journey been like on a personal on a, on a personal note? The emotional exhaustion is just what it is. Uh, many. Careers or emotional, I mean, physical exhaustion. Let me take that back. The mm -hmm. physical exhaustion. Yeah. It just is what it is. And many yeah. people's work is physically exhausting. The emotional and psychological um, experience is somewhat brutal. Hmm. The invisibilization, the erasure, the insults, the smears, the lies. Yeah. The politics of personal destruction worse this time than last time and worse hmm. than other candidates go through. So, um, that's something, but when I'm out there actually discussing things that matter with the American people, it's exhilarating and I'm, I'm in it to win it. And I hope that Listen, nobody knows, uh, nobody ever has guarantee of winning a political contest. There is a, there's a phrase, uh, fully invested in an effort yet unattached to the results. And that's what you're trying to achieve. This place within yourself where you're fully invested in the effort. Nothing worth doing in life is predicated on whether or not you have a guarantee of quote unquote success. 100%. The things that most need to be doing, you need to be doing, are because you know somewhere inside yourself it is the right thing to do. Yeah, I would like to briefly talk about the situation in Israel and Gaza. And very early on, you called for an immediate ceasefire. Uh, obviously, it's heartbreaking to see thousands and thousands of innocent people continue to die on both sides. And but we can see that many children are dying in Gaza. And we all agree, and I, I think I can speak for you here unequivocally, that Israel has the right to defend itself. Uh, but we must protect innocent civilians. Uh, data and survey that are coming out right now suggests that majority of Americans are in support of a ceasefire 
Do you think the current administration is making a critical mistake in not calling for a ceasefire or are they doing enough? I think that it, it's it, the ceasefire itself is is not the only issue here. So a ceasefire is where two people, two sides agree to something. Right. The ceasefire does not mean unilaterally one side stops shooting. It's an, a ceasefire agreement. So it would mean we stop that. You get back the hostages. Right. And then we go into an immediate into an immediate plan for something uh, moving forward. The president's. Um, what the president has done, which is out of alignment with um, many people in the United States, is that his immediate response displayed, well, it, it, his immediate response displayed an, an appropriate moral clarity. But right after that, it displayed a pro-Israeli preference that did not include appropriate recognition of the injustices suffered by Palestinians over the last decades. So that, for instance, when he said the next day, I'm going to meet with Jewish leaders, if I'd been president, it would be to, I'm going to meet with Jewish leaders today and also with right. Arab American leaders today. Right. So on one hand, the recognition of the brutality of the of Hamas, um, he was slow on the uptake to recognize that not all Palestinians are Hamas by any means. But there are a lot of people on the left who are slow on the uptake and not realizing that not all Israelis are Bibi Netanyahu either. Hmm. Right. So I think that what we're we're going through right now is a moment in which there is such imbalance in the perspectives of people on both left and right. And I believe that the United States needs to be, to see our highest ally as humanity itself. Mm. So ceasefire, yes, but ceasefire, ceasefire is an agreement between two. Right. Right. And it should be a ceasefire in exchange for the release of the hostages. And even without the release of the hostages, it is absolutely appropriate that people are deeply, deeply upset, not only about the deaths of people in Gaza, but the overall strategy around that, which is Bibi Netanyahu's um, this man is not the leader uh, that Israel needs at this time, I can tell you that. And the, we should remember that hundreds of thousands of Israelis had been even prior to October 7th in the streets protesting his leadership. If I were president, I would be working very much, and I'm sure some of this is going on behind the scenes, not only with European allies, but with Arab allies as well, 